I love well water. Oh, that's clean. That's you beautiful. You can come over and get some of that. I, I imagine I could. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for today and everyone that you brought into this house that we've consecrated and set aside for your purposes. And Lord, we ask you to be with us today in a big way and all those who couldn't be here today as well. Father, we're going to talk about courage today, Lord. And so I just would ask that you would speak into our hearts, not my words or my illustrations or my thoughts, but yours, Father, that you would speak through me, but your Holy Spirit would touch the lives of those people in this house today, that they would leave here with a new sense of courage in their Christian walk. So be with us now as we worship you, Lord. May everything that we do glorify your name. Help us, aid us as we lift to you our songs and our prayers, our petitions, our requests, and our adoration. Thank you so much in your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. There we are, right? Oh, yeah. You can stand a bit. Or say it's sitting. It's up to you, right? Extension cord. 
You would let us use your, your outdoor block, wouldn't you, Karen? There you go. And so we're looking to do something. We have some nice days up ahead, forecast. We'll probably do something out, outside, maybe uh, get some more members of the community in uh, to watch and to listen. I think that would be, I think, fun. Let's just take some time and worship the Lord. And uh, let's stand again. If you need to sit down at any time, please feel free to do that. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus to Nazarene and wonder how he can love me, a sinner condemned of me. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful that my song shall end. Yeah. 
a good Father, amen, our Father in heaven. And uh, we just want to praise Him this morning.
shortly here. And we need to uh, pray for Lois, please. And uh, pray for our congregation. Pray for those who couldn't be here. Our communities. We have an election coming up. I, I will not tell you where to vote or I won't make any suggestions. Um, I think that even would be against the law. I'm not sure. But I would, and it's true, I would, however, encourage you to vote your conscience, be involved in that in our, for our province, and uh, I'll leave that and, you know, that's where that is. Uh, we need to pray for those, you know, for this situation where the COVID-19 and uh, uh, still spreading by foolishness. And, you know, I think we have to pray that some young people, older people as well, but a lot of young people, uh, just come to their senses and understand that this is a dangerous thing. It really is. And uh, uh, let's pray that more people come into our church. We can safely, we have room left here to safely put them in. And, uh, and so just pray, pray for those things. And uh, we're going to sing this beautiful song to prepare your hearts called In His Time. And uh, it's a gorgeous, we'll try to do it justice. And... Uh, and just to prepare your hearts for a time of prayer. In his time. Father, strengthen us. We're in a time of sickness, a time of 
stress, a time of restrictions, a time that's been unprecedented in most of our lives, Lord. Please help us to endure, help us to, to love the unlovable, to forgive the unforgivable. Help us, Lord, to be the children that you would want us to be, to be the human beings that you would want us to be, to be Christians or followers of Yeshua, followers of your Son, Jesus, in the way that we ought to be. Help us to do that. Father, for those that may be sick, those that may be struggling financially or in their relationship or even in their spirituality, Lord, we ask that your presence weigh heavy upon them. That if there is a sickness, Lord, that the very bomb from heaven's gates will flow upon them. And I, in selfishness, lift up my wife Lois to you, who's struggling with her heart these days. And I ask, Father, as I have for decades now, that you bring a healing into her life. Lord, I'm going to be the persistent widow, and I'm not going to give up. Father, I just anyone here in this place that might be suffering or ailing in ways, and I know that there are people here that have various illnesses or problems, Lord, and I ask, Lord, that you give them some relief, that you, that you just push the pains and the aches and the concerns out for a period of time or whatever is on your mind, whatever your will is, that you would do that. And I ask, Father, though, that as we prepare to, to listen to your message today, again, that you would speak to people to their heart, and that you would raise them up to be the followers of your Son, that you would want them to be, that we would have the courage to do what we know we ought to do, and the courage not to do those things that we ought not to do, Lord. And so, Father, have mercy on us. Pour your love upon us. Pour your mercy upon us. And we will thank you and be grateful for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Sam. And uh, I want to attempt to sing a song for you before we uh, before we bring the message today. And uh, I'll see what I can do. Uh, like I said, uh, we were uh, kept alert a great deal of the evening. And uh, let's see what we can do. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing back. I stood on the stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be alright. But right now, oh right now I just can't It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down What will I say when I'm held to the plate like I am?
think uh, before we get going, just talk about courage. We need to read that beautiful passage. It's at the beginning, Karen. First uh, Corinthians thirteen, uh, chapter. First Corinthians thirteen, verses four to seven. Have you got it there?
get to us and we are tempted to move into a place that we ought not to. And that's where we need courage. That's where we need courage today. We're going to read uh, uh, Psalm 27. And uh, it'll, Karen will have it up on the screen for you. You can work in your, your scripture, Psalm 27. And uh, it's an incredible psalm. And uh, David's talking here about trust in God in the tumultuous times in which he was living. Psalm 27. And we're going to lean into verses 11 to 13. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Through the host and camps against me, my heart will not fear. The war arise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will differ in his tent. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. And here we go. Here we go. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level or right path. Because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries. For the false witnesses have risen against me. And such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed. That I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then it's as if David pauses. He looks at his reflection. He thinks about what he said and what he's thinking. And he speaks to himself here. He's trying to convince himself. He's trying to encourage himself. And he says what we find in verse 14 this. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. This is what he says to himself. And many times this is what we need to say to ourselves. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. So what exactly is courage? What exactly is courage? A dictionary says that courage is the strength in the face of fear or pain or grief. That takes courage. It's a sense of acting in a way or responding in a way that takes a risk. It's not too much of a risk, but not cowardly as well. It gives us a level plane to stand on, to stand up and stand against those that treat us poorly or those that would seek to do us or those that we love harm. All this being said, there are many, but I want to focus on six types of courage that I would like to look at today. And they're in your bulletin, so you can take them home with you. They're on the back, and you can read them again. Physical, social, emotional, intellectual, moral, and spiritual are all of the types of courage that we're going to look at today. 
The first one we're going to look at is physical courage. Physical courage. Many times this courage is the first thing we think. You know, we think about someone, uh, a soldier running across the field against a rain of bullets coming on them to, to save someone or to take out a, a position or whatever. And, and that's what we sort of define as a physical courage because they are taking their physical bodies and throwing it against the enemy. Physical courage is pushing yourself, in essence, beyond what you might see or experience as something that is comfortable. It's a bravery that risks bodily harm or even death, where bravery really is just courageous behavior. It is a character trait that you should embrace. Lance Armstrong said, if you're worried about falling off the bike, you'd never get on it in the first place. If you're worried about, can you summon up physical courage, you never will. You will defeat yourself before that happens. There's an individual I only know as Halloch, and he said this, let me read. He said, you can prepare yourself as much as possible for such circumstances where you are in desperation, but when push comes to shove, most people's minds will break before their body does. The mind plays a much larger role in the physicality of our survival beyond so much more that we can muster up. Now the book of Romans chapter 5 and or chapter 8 verses 5 to 6 says this. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit... For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the spirit of God, the mind that embraces the spirit of God, the mind that consumes the spirit of God will strengthen in body. The Spirit of God will help you to strengthen what you have within you. I, I watched a, I'm watching a show right now uh, called Eco Challenge uh, on, on, uh, on the TV. And it's the world's toughest race. And it is. 60 teams of four start. And not all of them finish. They climb 1,000 foot uh, waterfalls with slippery rocks. They go 12 kilometers through frozen water. They slash through the jungle. They, 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 it, it's unbelievable. But as I've been watching this, I've been watching it for a couple days now, I've been lost, we see that so many of them give up because they think they can't go on. Some do because their bodies are just broken or cut or bruised or spent, but many of them quit because their mind tells them, I can't do this, and it defeats their body. We, if we come to the Lord, if we seek a spiritual mind, will be able to summon up a bodily, physical courage when it is necessary. There's also a social courage. This type of courage is familiar to most of us. It risks us embarrassing ourselves or people coming against us. It allows you, in essence, to be comfortable in your own skin. Winston Churchill once said, Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak, as well courage is what it takes to sit down and listen. Being a Christian is difficult. Being a Christian is difficult. It would be so much easier not to follow Christ. It would be so much easier not to try a life based on the writings and the movement of the Holy Spirit. It would. You could do what you want to do, say what you want to say. People have different morals, different ethics, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But when you make a decision to follow Yeshua, when you make a decision to follow Christ and you live a different lifestyle, you're going to come up against opposition. Socially, you need courage. 
People will abandon you, perhaps. Family will cause you problems, or people in your family may not talk to you because you choose to worship God, you choose to come to church, you choose to tithe to support the church and the different movements that we're trying to do, and they don't understand it. And you should do something else. Why can't we go to the ball game on Sunday? Why would you go to church? Why are you doing these things? Why don't you drink? I, I don't have a problem drinking. Drink it in the Bible, right? It just says if you're going to get drunk, get drunk in the Holy Spirit. But people who drink to excess, oh, why can't you get blotted? Why can't you party? Why can't you do that? Because it's not what God calls us to do. We need to take care of our bodies. We need to take care of ourselves. And people will look down on you. People will say things to you. It's going to be difficult for you socially if you are a Christian. Many people will cause you some grief. And that's where you need a social courage to be able to say the things that you need to say. And do and live the way that you need to live. We also need an emotional courage. An emotional courage. The kind of courage that opens us up to the full spectrums of things that we think and emotions. Now, I did some research and I have here before me the most common emotions that you can have. The most common emotions that we all have. And they are this, happiness, sadness, anger, anticipation, fear, loneliness, jealousy, disgust, surprise, trust, contempt, hate, and awe. These are all emotions. And we've talked about this many, many times. You have, you have absolutely no control over your emotions. You don't. You're going to feel a certain way. You can have one or all of these emotions at some point, and you have no control over it. But what you have control over is how you act and how you react. Many times people ask me what my greatest strength and my greatest weakness is. That's a common question. Whenever you go to a new church, I'm not going to any new church anytime soon. This is it. I'm going to be here. I'm going to have to take my dead, cold, clammy hands out of this place. All right? That's it. But what I'm saying, all the churches I have gone to in the past, they always ask the same question. And maybe in jobs do. What's your greatest strength and what's your greatest weakness? So you have to think and contemplate, right? My greatest strength is I wear my emotions on my sleeves. If you upset me, you won't have to guess that I'm upset. It'll be written all over me. And that's a strength because I believe that there's no pretense. You don't have to guess how I feel, right? You will know how I feel. You can see it on me. And my greatest weakness is the same thing. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. When I first went into ministry in some of the classes in, at college, and uh, they said, you're going to have to really sort of hide your emotions. You can't be emotional. You have to, you have to sort of be very professional. And uh, I said, I can't do that. <laughs> right? I don't play hockey. I don't play politics very well. It's an issue, but it's, it's mine. And some people then now see that since you wear your emotions on your sleeve, that you're weak. You can't contain yourself. You can't do whatever. And I think that's wrong. I think it takes a lot of courage, courage to wear your emotions on your sleeve. I think it takes a lot of courage to show your emotions, but control those emotions. Right? Control those emotions. Proverbs 26 and 23 to 25. Like an earthen vessel overlaid with silver dross, are burning lips and a wicked heart. He who hates disguises it with his lips, but he lays upon deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. You may not hate you may not hate, and I hope that you do not, but whatever emotions you have are going to be in your heart. And if you come out with, with jealousy or disgust or contempt or hate 
or anger, that is going to lay heavy on your heart. It will be a deceit on your heart. We need to have an intellectual courage. It speaks to the willingness to engage in new ideas and thoughts and questions and our thinking. Uh, Marie Curie, a scientist, once said, nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. I believe Pete Ennis, a college professor, said this. Let me read word for word. Doubting God is painful and frightening because we think we are leaving God behind. But we're only leaving behind the idea of God we like to surround ourselves with. The small God. The God we control. The God who agrees with us. Doubt forces us to look at who we are and think about who God is. I believe me, that each and every one of us, on our Christian walk, at some point, will have a doubt or will have a moment of unbelief. We'll have a doubt or an unbelief that God has our best interest in mind or that God will do what we think God should do. I've been praying for Lois for 20 years five years since her first heart attack. 25 years. And each year her heart gets worse. And last night she dropped down another step, I believe. And her heart's much worse. And there are times when I've said, God, why would you let her suffer like this? She loves children. She loves church. She loves uh, you. And you know, almost every day I pray, can you heal her? Can you heal her? Can you, you know? And I've got to tell you, there are times when I thought, God, you know, have I done something wrong? Are you really there? Why would you do this? Because if you're a God, if you're all that, all knowing, all seeing, all powerful, all strength, graceful, merciful, why can't you pour a little bit of, of that upon my wife? Now you may say to me, no, I've never had a doubt since I've come to know the Lord. I've never had a moment of unbelief, and I would be this close to calling him a liar. I believe that this is not necessarily a bad thing, because when you have some doubts, when you have some moments of unbelief, it drives you back into the Word of God to figure out why. It drives you back on your knees. It drives you to seek God in a more powerful, intimate way. It propels you because you want this. You want the Lord. You want to be spiritual. You know that you're going to heaven. You want to walk on the narrow road. And there are times when you have those doubts, but it drives you back. So, so in those doubts, you may move towards those wide roads that have desired and enticed you. But we need to come back onto the narrow road. We need intellectual courage. Courage of thought courage of belief, courage of understanding about what's going on in our lives, in the lives of our faith family, in the lives of Christians in general. There are consequences to what we say and what we do and what we think. There are. When you have those moments of unbelief or moments of, of disbelief or, or doubt, have the courage to get back on the road. Because if you don't, and there are consequences, happily with courage, face those consequences, accept those consequences, put them behind you, and get back on the road of life. Always. Always, always seek the truth. And the one truth is this, that doubt can be paralyzing. Paralyzing in our lives. Whether about life and death and sickness 
and financial issues and relationship problems or our spirituality. Doubt and unbelief can be paralyzing in our lives. But with courage, you can move beyond that. If you press on, you will discover the answers and strength. We need a moral courage in life. We do the right thing. We know what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is true, what is false. Moral courage. We need to rise above what others say to do what is right. Martin Luther King left us with these beautiful words. Never, never be afraid to do what is right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments, listen to this, this man was smart. This man was wise. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. God said to his people in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 17, Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless, defend the orphans, plead for the widow. We also need a spiritual courage, and that's the last one we're going to look at. It fortifies us when we grapple with questions of faith, or our purpose in this life, or the meaning of life for us. A life lived for Jesus. In 1975, a Jesuit philosopher named John Cavanaugh went to Calcutta to work in the House of the Dying with Mother Teresa. Now, the House of the Dying was a place where you could get medical care, where you could get some sort of comfort. But, in the House of the Dying, you could only go there if that was the last resort. If you'd gone to every other clinic, every other hospital, every other place looking for comfort, looking for some sort of healing, looking for some sort of, uh, of, of anything, you could go there. But if you hadn't ex sort of exhausted everything else, she wouldn't let you come in. This was a place of last resort and despair where Mother Teresa could lift you up and do whatever she could. And Kavanaugh wanted to go and talk to Mother Teresa. And she said to her, I want you to pray for me. Mother Teresa said, what do you want me to pray for? And he said, I want you to pray that I have clarity. And John said that, that Mother Teresa sort of stepped back a little bit, really stared into his eyes and looked at him and said, um, uh, nope. Not going to do it. And he couldn't believe it. He asked Mother Teresa to pray for him. And Mother Teresa says, no, I'm not praying for that. And John said, well, you have such clarity in your life. Why wouldn't you pray for clarity in, in my life? And she looked at him and says, I have absolutely zero clarity in my life. But what I do have is trust in God. Therefore, I will pray for you that you will have and gain more trust in God. Author Richard Bach says this. It's a beautiful uh, piece of wisdom for those who don't really know what their purpose is or think that, you know, many of us are starting to get a little older. We think, oh, our life's gone by. We've done what we're going to do. There's really not much more for us to do, not only just for the Lord, but in life. And this man said this. He said, here's a test to find whether your purpose in life is finished. Here's the test. Are you ready? He said this. If you're alive, it isn't. As long as you are alive, you have purpose in life. You have a mission in life. You will have more purposes. You will have more understandings. Life brings to us at different ages many different but satisfying things. When I was 45, when I was 45, uh, 44 or so, 
Uh, I went into the ministry. And before that, just before that, I thought, I can't go into the ministry because I'm getting ready to retire from the armed forces, right? I'm getting old. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I was getting older. And, and could I do that? And could I go back to school for four years? Could I, you know, is it worth it? But I have enough time in ministry after that? And, you, you know, you ask yourself some of these questions. And I've been to four years. And I've been in the ministry almost 20 years. And I have a lot more to go. We all, as long as we're alive, have purposes and a mission, responsibilities, life to be lived, life to be discovered. And we need the, the spiritual courage to grasp onto that. John 16, 32 and 33 in closing. Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered. Now Jesus is talking to his followers. Each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that you, uh, that, that in me you may have peace. And then he speaks to us across the ages and says, In the world you have tribulations, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Amen. And so we understand the courages that we need to embrace. The moral, the ethical, the intellectual, the, the, the bodily, the physical, spiritual, the, the so much more. And, and we stand in front of the mirror in life. And you should do the same thing at some time today. You should stand in front of the mirror. If you have any lack of courage, if you have any doubt, if you have any unbelief, you need to stand in front of the mirror as David stood in front of himself and ask these questions of yourself. Say this to yourself. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Father, we do wait for you. We do love you. We understand that your wisdom is perfect, that your knowledge is unbounding. We understand that you have our best interest. We want your path and your plans for our lives to be our path and our plans. But in this plan, on our journey, on the road, within this pandemic, within all of the other struggles of life, Lord, we ask you for the courage, the courage that you want us to grasp. And so my prayer in closing of this message, Lord, that has hopefully come from you through me into the hearts of those that are in this place now, is that we find, grasp, are given and embrace courage. Courage to live the abundant life that you died to give us. And I will thank you in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 We're going to uh, sing to you. <laughs> and uh, Seth has broken up the drum here. He's growing in his gifts. He is. And, uh, and so we're going to stand and uh, sing this together. And uh, when you are feeling it's time, please head out. Please social distance. Uh, and uh, no hugging or kissing today. Uh, which is unfortunate. I know, I know. And uh, and uh, let me say this before we start to sing. May God bless you. May God give you courage. May God love you and hold you close till we meet again. Amen.